God, you are our delight. You are our reward. And it is such an incredible, undeserved privilege to know you, to have been called by you, to have entered into a saving relationship with you, God, to know you as our treasure, to have the hope of dwelling with you eternally. We could never repay or offer due thanks for such realities. And yet you tell us as those who believe in you, who trust your son to claim them, God, as our own. And so this morning we do that. We again remind ourselves of what you say is true. And I pray that as we open up your word, that you would help us to again marvel at these things, that it would compel us to live more faithfully to you, to be more steadfast in the truth, to labor harder, to be more sincere in, in faith. And we know these are impossible apart from your spirit. And so we pray that you would work, help us to listen attentively, help me to be clear as we fix our eyes on your word once more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. This morning we'll conclude our series on ecclesiology, um, the local church. We've been talking about what the local church is, what the local church must do and be, and in particular, as we think carefully about reduplicating ourselves nearby, we've been thinking carefully about what we must be about, the things that we have to value and fix our gaze on as a local church in order to plant other churches well. And this morning, this passage in 1 Timothy 3 is going to reinforce those things that we've been hearing and really help us get a high view of the local church, what the local church is to God himself. In a recent conversation with a friend, this friend told me that she had come to the conclusion over the past few years that the church is useless to society and to Jesus himself. The church is useless in pursuing Jesus. Of course, the first thing that I wanted to know is, what church are you talking about? Because if this is true of the church as a whole, then that's very bad news, not only for the church, but for the rest of the world. The church is not useless. The church, God's church, is not only useful, but essential. She is essential to what God is doing in the world. Primarily, what God is doing in the world is happening in and through and comes from faithful local churches. Without the church, God would go unrepresented in the world. Without the church, God's truth will not, cannot be upheld. Both God's reputation and God's truth depend on the proper working of the local church. That is by design. God has tied those things, his reputation and his truth, to the proper working of local churches. You know, sometimes, I'm sure, if you're like me, 
you can get so busy in your involvement even in the local church that you can forget the glorious ends for which God intends. God intends glorious ends for the church. The things that he has given the local church to do and be about, to busy ourselves with, the things that for us are just commonplace, we come every week to uh, sing together. I don't know if you've ever thought how strange that is, just a, a room full of hundreds of people singing to a man who we say is God, who is currently in heaven. That is a little weird. That's what God's given us to do. And we love it that way, don't we? <laughs> That's strange to the world to come and be preached at for an hour, sometimes longer. <laughs> and we love it that way. You love to sit under the preaching of God's word. And to the world, that, that's just strange. That's not normal. And praise God for that. We can get so busy engaging in those good, beneficial activities that we forget really the role, the invaluable role that we play as a church, that those small things play in God's grand plan for this world to exalt his own name and to make known his truth. So as we wrap up our series on ecclesiology this morning, we must consider the inseparable connection between three of the church's chief burdens. That's where we're going this morning. We must consider the inseparable connection between three of the church's chief burdens. Those three burdens, those things that God has given the church to be primarily concerned about, to have always on our minds to never forget, to constantly be pursuing for good ends, those three burdens, God's given us these three things that we'll see unfold in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Starting at verse 14, I'll read it for us. Paul tells his son in the faith whom he left at Ephesus, I am writing these things, everything I've written thus far and what else I'll write in 1 Timothy. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. In this passage, we have three burdens that the local church bears, every individual local church and every, by virtue of every individual local church, every single believer who is a member of a local church, which there is no other biblical category for Christians except those who are members of local churches, bear the responsibility for these burdens. These are not burdens in the sense of uh, things that you carry because you have to, because they are laborious for you, but these burdens are ones that you willingly embrace, you joyfully embrace if you're a Christian, and you would have it no other way. You are thankful as a believer, as a member of God's church, to consider these things that your concerns would be wrapped up in these things. What are these chief burdens of 
the local church, number one, our own conduct. Our own conduct. Paul says in verse 14, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus. He says earlier in the book, and there is shepherding that needs to take place in Ephesus. False teachers are undermining the good instruction happening in Ephesus. They need to be instructed to stop it. Widows need to be cared for. Men need to be instructed on how to be men in the church and how to lead. Women need to be instructed to not teach, but instead how to fulfill God's ordained role for them. The shepherds, including Timothy, (coughs) need instruction as well. The entire church needs to know what to look for in elders, what to look for in deacons, and all kinds of other things that are true and common in body life in the local church. Paul is eager to get back to Timothy, but he is writing these things to Timothy, even though he's hoping to come before long, He's writing in case he's delayed. And the particular reason, which becomes something of the purpose statement of the book, why Paul is writing, verse 15, is so that you, that is Timothy, would know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. That's why Paul's writing. The, state, the specific statement that Paul is eager for Timothy to know is how one ought to conduct himself. That is, Timothy needs to know, as one of the shepherds in Ephesus, shepherding this local body, Timothy needs to be well aware of what everybody's supposed to be doing in the church. No pastor can be ignorant of what the sheep's called to by God. And Timothy's no different in this. And so you watch, you read through 1 Timothy, and you can see Paul specifically targeting segments of the body. Timothy, here's what you need to know about false teachers. Here's what you need to know about men. Here's what you need to know about women. Here's what you need to know about elders and deacons and even those who will walk away from this household of God, chapter 4, verse 1 and following. You need to know these things. The goal of Paul's instruction to Timothy was that he would know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, particularly from flowing out of this biblical instruction. Just flip back to chapter 1, because we don't want to miss, as we talk about our own conduct, everybody's got roles to play in the local church, but the overarching aim in all of our conduct is chapter 1, verse 5. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul is writing to Timothy so that Timothy would confidently shepherd the various members of the local church in Ephesus to practice what I like to call piety-produced love. Piety-produced love. The various members of the local church have to love. And not just any kind of love, but love that flows out of a pious or holy, godly life. That is purity of heart, goodness of conscience, sincerity of faith, a pure inner life. All biblical instruction aims to purify the inner life so that the members of God's church will love from that holy life. And so this is what is primarily on Paul's mind as he's teaching Timothy, reminding Timothy, 
the various, of the various conduct of the various members of the local church. This communication you'll notice in verses 14 and 15 is coming by way of necessity. Paul is communicating this by necessity because he's saying, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I'm delayed, I'm still writing these things. In other words, even if I'm delayed, the instruction can't wait. The instruction can't be delayed. And I'm intending to make it there, but I'm writing in case I don't in a timely manner that I expect to. This carries a sense of urgency. The local church, particularly the shepherds, need to be well aware of what we have to be doing as a local church. You must be aware of your, the importance of your own conduct and its inseparable connection to these other burdens that we'll mention. Your conduct as a member of the local church is important. This is how one, anyone, ought to conduct himself in the household of God. This isn't just about deacons. This isn't just about elders. This isn't just about some small population. This is about any member of the household of God. The way you conduct yourself, particularly among the household of God in conjunction with the household of God, is important. And it's good for us to keep this in front of ourselves as we talk about church planting. Not only was the instruction about our conduct communicated by necessity, but it was undergirded by certainty. Notice in verse 15, I write so that you will know. So that you will know. Not so that you will have a a general idea, not so that you will not really be aware of the details, but have a, a big picture in mind, not so that you would be 99% certain, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. That kind of certainty that undergirded Paul's thinking about the church member's conduct, that's actually being undermined in our day. I mean, to have certainty. As you uh, heard John talk about the series on uh, interpretive authority not long ago. It doesn't feel long ago. It's probably almost a year now. I don't know. Several months ago. It is perceived as arrogance to be certain. If you are certain how you should conduct yourself in the household of God, for example, chapter 2, verse 12, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. That is, she is not to teach men in the congregation. If you were certain about something like that, that women should conduct themselves in this way, generally you would be perceived as arrogant. But it's if you didn't leave that up for debate, well, I could be wrong, right? If you didn't have that attitude, then you would be perceived as proud. That's not Paul's, Paul's mindset. He actually wants this to be well known. He's clear, he says it clearly, and he wants it to be received as such so that knowledge fills the mind of Timothy and by implication, the rest of the congregation in Ephesus. In, uh, in one academic book uh, written by a, a world-class scholar, this book was on interpreting Paul's epistles. And in the introduction on a book about how to interpret Paul's epistles, the author says, in every interpretation, we are dealing with degrees of probability in formulating an interpretation. Absolute certainty is impossible. And at that point, I was curious why I should read the rest of the book. That is common in our day. But Paul did not have that attitude. 
He wanted absolute certainty to be had when he articulated what he did. Our conduct, we must know what we must, how we must conduct ourselves as the local church. That is essential. And it is inseparable from the second thing, the second burden that we concern ourselves with, and that is God's reputation. Our conduct and God's reputation are inseparably connected to one another. I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. You'll notice these statements immediately follow as he describes the local church. These as he describes the importance of how we conduct ourselves, the importance of knowing how we ought to conduct ourselves, he calls the church the household of God and the church of the living God. The church of the living God. God's reputation is in view here. Namely, God's reputation as father and as living We'll unpack that in a second. What what this does not mean is that God's very nature or his character rides on our conduct. Praise God that that's not the case. God does not change or become what we portray him as in our practical lives. If if as the local church fails, God is not failing. As local churches... uh, live out weaknesses, perhaps, in the body life, God's character actually is not on the line there. God is who he is. He was great before there was a church. He'll be great after there is a church, right? God is inherently who he is. But his reputation, though, how his greatness and character and glory are perceived, well, that is riding on our conduct. Does the difference make sense? How we conduct ourselves as the local church says something to the world about who God is. Namely, who God is as father and who God is as living in comparison to idols. Where do, we, where do we see this in our passage? The church is the household of God. That is not a place. That's not a reference to a building. That is a reference uh, meaning family. <laughs> the household of God. The family of God. This is the family of God because God is the father of this family. We are the family of God by way of adoption. We did not always belong to God. We were, by nature, as Ashley just told us during communion, children of Satan, children of wrath. We did not belong to God. We have no right to God as our Father. He made us His children by adoption. We are His household. We have become His household. He is our God. He is our father. We are his children. Even in the book, this language, this familial language is found all throughout 1 Timothy. And you get a glimpse into what kind of father God is by the instructions that are written in the book. For example, the book starts off with God protecting his church. Flip back to chapter 1. Paul is the apostle of Christ Jesus according to the commandment of God our Savior. Who decreed that Paul would be an apostle? Well, God did. God decreed that. And the command of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. God the Son also decreed the same thing. They spoke together on Paul's apostleship. And what came from the pen of God the Father and God the Son's apostle? Well, protection, 
because the first thing he does in the book is deal with the very things that are a danger and a threat to his local church. In chapter, in verse three of chapter one and following is a discussion about false teachers and what to do with false teachers. God's protecting his church from false teaching. He does the same thing in chapter four, verse six, where he says, in pointing out these things to the brethren, brethren, that's interesting. How do you get brothers? Well, you have a family, brethren. In pointing out these things to the brethren, to God's family, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. And that is particularly in pointing out how apostasy happens through the insincerity of of liars, the hypocrisy of false teachers in the midst. This is God protecting his church, telling us what to be guarded from, even at the teacher level. God is a good father. He protects his family. Uh, Every good father gives instructions and instructs his household. Clearly, God is doing that in this book and in the rest of the New Testament, and then all of the scriptures are good for instruction. God is a, God's reputation as father is seen here even in his provision. Chapter 5, verse 8, in a discussion about how to think about widows, if they have children, let the children care for them. And Paul adds in verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, right, children not providing for their own widows in their family, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It would be foolish to think that on a human level, the worst human beings don't provide for their family and to think that that could possibly be true of God as father. He provides for his family temporally and spiritually. Chapter 1, verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement. Paul, again, wants us to be certain. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. God not only provides temporally and food, clothing for his family, but he provides spiritually, he provides salvation. He provides uh, instruction for our spiritual benefit. He provides siblings, if you will, that Christians are saved into a household for the spiritual benefit of each member. He provides stewards for his household and a structure to his household, as we see in chapter three with leaders in the church. God is a good father. His reputation as father is riding on our conduct as a church. If we fail to do what we must, what we have been commanded to by God as a local church, then the world will get an inaccurate picture, a false picture of God as father. And also... What else he says in verse 15? The church of the living God. This family, this household is the church. A called out, assembled group of believers operating according to the structure that God has given them. We are the church of the living God. Only one group of people either the church or some other group that exists in the world, has, can lay claim to this, being the possession of the living God. Only one, only one God lives. Either it is our Father, either it is Christ, or it's someone else. We demonstrate that we serve that we belong to, that we are children of the living God by our very conduct. That, that is why it is imperative that we conduct ourselves in the ways that God has ordained. Just like every father knows, people 
have certain thoughts of you when they get a glimpse into your home. Some of us are shuddering. Oh, man. Every time you go pick up your kids at NGM, how do they do? Uh, it, is, it is actually right, especially the younger your children are, when you have the most control of them. People do get a glimpse into your parenting by the conduct of your children. They, they develop a certain idea, a certain understanding about you as father and what happens in your home, what must be happening in your home by the conduct of your children. For good or bad, it's true. And the same is true of the church. When the world sees God's children, they get a glimpse of or an idea of what God is like as father. Thirdly, what else is inseparably connected to our conduct and God's reputation is thirdly, God's truth. God's truth. Paul says, verse 15, that this household of God, this church of the living God, is the pillar and support of the truth. It is not, as uh, some translations might unfortunately render this, the ground of the truth. It's not the foundation of the truth. That's a, a Catholic, an unfortunate Catholic error, that the church is the foundation of the truth. It determines what is truth, that the church decides what's in or out when it comes to the canon of Scripture. That's not the case. The church doesn't determine the truth, but it does uphold it. It does uphold it. This statement about the church being the pillar and support of the truth is not said about any other entity on earth. This is not true of your favorite teaching ministry. Your favorite podcast is not the pillar and support of the truth. Your favorite discernment blog is not the pillar in support of the truth. Your favorite Bible teacher is not the pillar in support of the truth. Useful campus ministries and other parachurch organizations are not the pillar in support of the truth. That title belongs to the church alone, and we should boast in that. That is the church the pillar in support of the truth. The, the, the church upholds the truth before the world. And so far from the church being useless to Jesus in the world, the church is essential to the world and specifically chosen by Christ. We uphold the truth before a watching world, and the primary truth, if you will, that we hold out before a watching world is articulated in verse 16. By common confession, this is undebatable, it's unquestioned by those who belong to God's household. This is by common confession. What is? Great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is a succinct way of describing Christ's ministry. From the incarnation to the ascension, this is true of Christ. We proclaim him, Paul says, That's our message. We don't have another message except what God has said is true. The gospel is our is our message. Jesus was revealed in the flesh. God eternal became God in the flesh. 
was vindicated in the Spirit. What the Spirit did in Christ's ministry proved who, that Christ was who he claimed to be. It justified all of his claims to deity, all of his claims to sonship and authority on earth. The Spirit vindicated Jesus. He was seen by angels all throughout his ministry. You see this, angels ministering to Jesus from his temptation uh, in the wilderness before the start of his ministry, at the start of his ministry, all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Angels serving him, doing God's bidding for Jesus' sake during his earthly ministry. He was proclaimed among the nations. Didn't go past a, a couple hundred miles from where he was born, and yet his name made its way very broadly among various peoples. He was believed on in the world and embraced as that long-awaited Messiah and then eventually taken up in glory. All things having been predicted from the Old Testament clearly revealed in Jesus' life. So the scriptures are true. That's our message. This is what we have to offer the world, contrary to the opinion of some. This is what God has given us to do. This is what the, the, we are the pillar and support of. Not establishing justice around the world, making sure that unbelievers act like the household of God apart from conversion. We're the pillar and support of the truth. That's our message. What does this mean for Grace Bible Church? If, if these three burdens, if we have these burdens and are tasked to carry these burdens as the local church, what does this mean for church planting and New Orleans? Well, it means, first of all, that Grace Bible Church must be a, a strong sending church. We should not reduplicate ourselves anywhere if we don't know how to conduct ourselves as God's household. And if practically we're not excelling at these things, then we're not worthy of reduplication. If you've been at Grace Bible Church for any length of time, then you've been blessed by the ministry here, the faithful labors of men and women who have endeavored to establish this church. Things like Build and Wellspring are the blessed fruit of faithful labors of the teachers over the years, the elders and deacons currently serving even are the fruit of years of labor. I'm the fruit of 13 plus years of faithful labors of the, the men and women at this church. I was saved four year, or four months before finding myself at this church and the teaching was already happening at, at such a high level. The discipleship was already so evident that I was eager to move here from Georgia so that I could be discipled here. Approached Josh Kelso on a Sunday. Hey, I uh, saw how you interacted with your family last week at the Resolve Conference in California. Would you disciple me? And then have him laugh and say yes. You know, <laughs> And so spending weeks in his home with him and Julie, watching them deal with their kids, having them counsel me right, as a young, arrogant, ambitious man. <laughs> we, have to be, we have to be a church who's doing that over and over and over again so that you can take a arrogant, 
know-it-all, unrefined guy like me when I was, when I got here in June 2008, and labor patiently, uh, rebuke, encourage, train, equip, so that we have more elders who are, who are able to, to faithfully teach and preach God's word, shepherd God's flock. We have to be a, a strong sending church. The convictions that undergird all of the good things, good ministry happening at Grace Bible Church. Remember, Paul says, so that one, anyone, would know how to conduct himself in the household of God. This isn't something just for, for leaders. This is a burden for every single member of the local church. Do you consider yourself a valuable, even indispensable part of church planting? You should. You should. The healthier the members of the church are, the average member, the common members of the local church, zealous servants, equipped disciplers, faithful with their own heart to read God's word, take in God's word, counsel others. The healthier you are, each member at doing that, the healthier uh, and better leaders husbands are in their homes, the more faithful you are, men, in leading your homes, discipling your wives, discipling your children, being faithful at the D2, discipline two level, where we talk about being in the homes. And then as all of you, members of Grace Bible Church, are faithfully shepherding your own hearts, shepherding in your home so that your home experiences the blessings of what God's doing in your own heart. The better you are at letting those things spill over into the various ministries as you serve and brush shoulders with the other members of the church and next generation ministries in your small groups, in Build and Wellspring, in the Titus Women's Study and wherever else you find yourself, those formal ministries and the informal moments, the better you are, the more faithful you are, the more godly you are in your conduct, in those things as God's household, the better we'll be able to plant churches. Each member is indispensable to making that happen. We have to be a strong sending church. particularly just thinking about New Orleans, we have to be a strong scent church. I didn't realize that I talked about New Orleans as much as I, I do apparently, because <laughs> people have heard about New Orleans who I've never talked to about it, or I didn't remember that I, I mentioned about it. When God saved me in 2008, I had left, I grew up in New Orleans, left New Orleans uh, to attend college in Georgia. Knew, even then, New Orleans isn't a great place to raise a family, it's not ideal. And so I had no intentions of going back to live. Fast forward four years, God saved me, and one of the first things I can remember desiring is that people in New Orleans would hear what I just believed. The way I heard the gospel articulated, the way I was forced from the preaching of God's word to question my own salvation, which was absolutely right and good, and it eventually led to my actual salvation, people in New Orleans need to hear that. And I was doing street evangelism and street preaching because I was excited about the gospel. Uh, there was a inner city housing projects right across the street from the college that I attended. And during my free time, I'd walk across the street and didn't have anybody to go with me because nobody else wanted to do it, so I'd evangelize people in the projects. I'm just excited about the gospel, and you got to hear this. Came here four months later, 
and realize what New Orleans is not missing. What New Orleans is missing is not just a, a, a guy who's excited about the gospel. New Orleans is missing churches of people who can articulate the gospel, who understand God's word, and have a message to proclaim to people so that if God should save them, they actually have something to be saved into. A church, a family. New Orleans is missing, a, is missing churches that are good representations of God's own character and truth. And so over the last 13 years, I've been being trained to that end. Send me to New Orleans. In 2010, welcome, was welcomed into an elder meeting, sat around the table with the elders, and they said, hey, we heard you want to go to New Orleans. I said, yep, tell us about that. I want to go to New Orleans. <laughs> and that was it. It was just a desire, unrefined. I have no idea how to get there, but I'm here a long way away. They said, okay, well, here's the kind of men we want to send. We want to send godly men. Uh, a church needs faithful leaders, shepherds who can preach God's word. You interested in that? Yep, all right, keep doing what you're doing. You're in, you, you're in build or in H3, which is the trust now. You're serving, keep doing that. Okay, five years later, in another elder meeting, you still have that desire to go to New Orleans? You've done kind of all the training that we've offered up to this point. Seminary would be next on the list. You still interested? Yep. All right. Let's get you an application for seminary. Start talking about that. You want to quit your job to do it? Sure. <laughs> Jerry, can I clean pools for you <laughs> while I go through seminary? Yep. All right. Seminary happened four years, five years plus later. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> um, and, and eventual, you know, eldership, here we are. Uh, training to see that happen. Why New Orleans? Um, besides the fact that I'm, I'm there, there's a gospel, uh, I'm from there, there's a gospel need. New Orleans, the city has 390,000, just over 390,000 people in New Orleans proper. And specifically in the area that we're aiming at, New Orleans East, there are 85,000 souls without a church like ours. And when I say without a church like ours, I'm thinking... Uh, expository preaching. I don't think there's a single church preaching expositorily in New Orleans right, with a robust pulpit ministry. But you add to that some other things that we value, like the sufficiency of the scriptures to counsel, plurality of leadership in the local church, discipleship, happening from the members of the local church, a church that is faithful to practice church discipline. Churches with those kinds of distinctives don't really exist in New Orleans. When I was looking to just presenting in 2018 to the elders, sort of, uh, you know, the third time I got to be in front of the elders to put this desire in front of them. I talked to some friends who have planted churches and said, if you could go sit with your elders again, being a decade in, knowing what you know now, what would you say to them? So I took that counsel, put down everything I could think of uh, that would be helpful to consider and put in front of our elders for planning a church. And I actually looked for churches that are like-minded, uh, like ours. The, the similar doctrine, at least, that we preach. You know, high view of God's sovereignty and salvation, high view of preaching and those kinds of things. 
the only churches that I could find um, came to about seven. And this was just, I'm looking on your website for what you affirm. Looking at websites like the Master Seminary website, uh, ACBC website, Nine Marks Ministries, you know, with, that might have some semblance of, of what we do here. Each of those churches, well, it totaled about eight. Some of those aren't even churches anymore because they were church plants that never really uh, got off the ground. And each of those churches had some kind of cultural renewal mandate, so a social justice component to its, its mission as a church, things that we would not affirm. Uh, people take a lot of pride in the city of New Orleans. So if you live there, it's a big deal. I'm, you know, live in New Orleans, love New Orleans. So to go do something for the city in terms of restoring the look of the city and renewing the culture is significant. If you took just a couple families from our church and planted them in New Orleans today, the convictions that we have as a church would already be radically different than what's around in the city of New Orleans. And so I think often about these 390,000 plus souls, these 85,000 plus souls in New Orleans East in particular, without a solid local church. Since that research, I have found, uh, thankfully, a church that's very like-minded. Emily and I went out with Kyle and Ashley Frazee in, fe in February. We looked at churches. Kyle looked up on Google, expository preaching, New Orleans. One church came up in the Google search. We're going there tomorrow. <laughs> and got to spend time with their pastors at NOLA, NOLA Baptist is the name of that church. And we're, we're still finding out how like-minded we are. It's pretty sweet. That church is not in New Orleans East. And people in New Orleans East, it's at least enough of a distance for people in New Orleans East, one of their members who's from New Orleans East, to consider relocating. So you think, what would it take for somebody to relocate to be a part of this church? Where would they have to be in the valley to make them think, I want to relocate? Good year, maybe? That's how it feels to drive from New Orleans East to uptown New Orleans where Nola Baptist is. So New Orleans East needs a, needs a sound church. In terms of what is there, just briefly, one of the Southern Baptist Convention's flagship schools is in New Orleans, the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. This, church, uh, this uh, seminary has, uh, there are 125 Southern Baptist Convention churches associated with uh, the SBC in, the, in, in New Orleans. But these would be, you know, if you think about the, the seminary, the kinds of uh, men leaving a seminary who, have, who embrace the seminary's convictions, this seminary is uh, anti-biblical counseling, so they would uh, teach integrationism, that psychology is a valid means of instruction and help for the believers, for, for the church. Um, Arminian not uh, reformed in, in their view of God's sovereignty when it comes to salvation. And so the kinds of men coming from that seminary would, would be that. There are two certified biblical counselors near New Orleans, uh, and within, last time I checked, 75 to 100 miles of New Orleans, two certified biblical counselors. That's, by comparison, there are 22 or 21 
within like a 15-mile radius of Gilbert. And if you've been in equipping hour, you know that not all biblical counselors are biblical counselors, but it's a helpful comparison to consider. A lot of the city is Roman Catholic, about 36% of New Orleans is Roman Catholic. And the Christian denominations that are there primarily fall into Pentecostalism, prosperity gospel, churches pursuing social justice, Southern Baptists. There is, there's a need for, for sound churches in New Orleans. I've been asked the question quite a bit, why New Orleans? I think a better question is why not? Why not New Orleans? We could go lots of places, but until God's reputation and God's truth um, is, has adequate foothold in a place, is being accurately represented by the conduct of local churches in a place, then we have work to do. And so New Orleans is one of those places that could use a sound church like Grace Bible. What we're doing currently, there are a number of families who are prayerfully considering going to New Orleans, uh, about 13 households total. Um, and there's a spectrum from, I'm eager to go, when are we leaving, to we're going to walk in that direction, not really sure, not, not sure if we should go yet. And so for the next at least couple years, few years, we want to train a team. Uh, we have to be a strong scent church. So that means we have to be able to disciple others. Most essentially, that's what that means, is a church that is able to be the church day one when we get to New Orleans. And so, Lord willing, the latest that will, will be sent out from Grace Bible Church is the summer of 2024. That may seem like a long way off to you. It's not, it's not that long. And yet I'm, I'm eager to go as soon as possible. But we have to make sure that Grace Bible Church is a strong sending church and that a church in New Orleans is a strong sent church. And so as you think about your role in this endeavor, even if, you've had, if you have no desire to go to New Orleans or anywhere else but to be in Tempe, you are essential to us sending strong churches. Your conduct in the local church is a burden that you carry for the sake of God's reputation and God's truth. And you, as the members of Grace Bible Church, make church planting happen. And so I pray that you will labor even more zealously to these ends and that you will pray more faithfully to these same ends. God, thank you so much for establishing this church, for giving us the clarity of knowing where we fit into what you are primarily doing in the world as you are saving people into your family by adoption as you are raising them up and making them useful servants within your church, and as you are forcing the gospel to go further to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the valley, to the ends of this country, and the rest of the world, you are using your local church to accomplish those great ends. Make us useful. Help us to excel still more. And we pray that you would do this, not for our glory, but for your namesake alone. Amen.